All right, hey everybody. My name is Amber Brown and I am the CEO and owner of Ivy League Tutoring. And today we're doing part five of our decoding lab values and we're gonna go over infection and sepsis labs today. So we've already done GI and kidney and CBC and we did something else that I can't remember. Um, so we're kind of decoding all of the different things. So today our main focus is gonna be on infection so that you fully understand what labs we run for infection, why we run them, and how to interpret them. Those are the three biggest things we're gonna to cover today. So as you guys come in, I just kinda of wanna tell me uh, where you're coming from, who you are. I know we have a lot of repeat people that are coming in and watching these, so I think that is absolutely fantastic. This video will be available for 24 hours on the Facebook page, and then we're gonna take it down, send it to editing, and then eventually the entire series will be available um, for you guys uh, on our videos on demand. So we've got tons of videos on demand that are like this. Some in a, are a setting with this, just me and the camera, or just one of our tutors in the camera. Some of them are in group settings, so you kind of get that group dynamic, and there's topics on all kinds of things. So if there's something that we are missing on videos on demand that you desperately need for your upcoming exam, let us know, and we will do our best to get those videos uploaded for you, um, get that topic at least on the calendar. We're probably gonna do one more decoding lab values as we're kind of wrapping up summer semester, which is exciting, and we're getting ready and geared up for fall. Um, we will start our fall semester back at the end of August. Um, and so we're super excited and getting ready to bring you guys some new and exciting things. So with that said, I want you to come in, tell me who you are, what nursing school you're from, and kind of where you're at so I know who's gonna be joining us today. Now there will be um, a little bit of a delay in the live videos, so don't panic, okay? Um, and if you miss anything, we're going to make it available on the page. So again, don't panic, all right? Um, today I'm gonna to be doing more straight teaching so that way we can get through the material in a more timely fashion. So today we're gonna to be talking about all things infection, right? What do you need to know? So the first thing I kinda of wanna start out with, and it doesn't matter what infection we're, we're going over, um, is I wanna talk about the different kinds of infection that we're going to be seeing, especially sepsis is another big one we're gonna be covering today. Reason being, um, we don't cover sepsis as much as we should and it happens to all kinds of people all of the time. So we're gonna make sure that we cover and that you fully understand sepsis um, and what that looks like in the labs that you're gonna draw for that, okay? Um, so to start out, we already did a full video on the CBC and decoding the CBC. What we didn't do in that video was talk about the differential. So a lot of times you will see either on exams or you'll see in the hospital, doctor ordered a CBC with diff is what we call it, but it's really a CBC with differential. When we do a CBC and we do the white blood cell count, all that tells us is there's an infection somewhere in the body or a huge inflammatory response. It does not tell us where the infection is. It doesn't give us any clue as to what we're, what we're looking for, right? Once we pinpoint that there's an infection present, we have to find out where it is because there are certain antibiotics that only cover certain infections. So it's important for us to identify the source of the infection and it's important for us then to choose the antibiotic that is going to be susceptible to that bacteria. The only way that we are able to do that or at least kind of get a clue if we're really not sure where um, the patient's infection is coming from is to do the CBC with diff, okay? I mentioned this in the CBC video, I'm gonna mention it again, okay? If you do uh, choose a CBC on your exam, they'll say, what do you do for your patient, right? And you just choose a CBC for baseline. There really is no CBC baseline in the hospital because once the patients come to us, they're ill, they're sick, so it's not really a baseline CBC, do you see what I mean? So whenever you're doing a CBC, it's gotta be for a very specific reason. Today we're gonna cover mainly the differential. Now we know that, when we do a CBC, which is a complete blood count, we're looking for the WBCs, just a bunch of letters I'm gonna throw at you today in different orders and they're gonna mean different things. So CBC is the complete blood count, okay? So in the CBC, that's gonna have your white blood cells, your red blood cells, platelets, hemoglobin, hematocrits, MCBC, MCHG, all these different things that are just gonna give us an idea of what's going on in their blood, all right? What we want to do if we think the patient has an active infection is to do a CBC with differential. The differential is gonna give us the specific types of white blood cells that are present in the body and tell us what those numbers are. Now, you guys will not have to know in nursing school and really when you're a nurse what the different numbers for the differential white blood cells are, but we are gonna cover what they are and how to interpret those if they are off, okay? So there are a couple of different kinds of white blood cells and each one has specific jobs that they do. So they come out during certain times of inflammation or certain times of infection. 
The biggest ones that you will see that come out and the ones that we have in the most number are called neutrophils. Neutrophils are kind of the first on the scene. They're gonna get out there, they're gonna look around, they're gonna figure out, okay, is this a virus? Is it a bacteria? Is it a fungus? Is it an inflammatory response? Is it a burn? Is it, what is it, okay? Because we have to get an idea of what the enemy is before I can send out specialist troops in order to meet that specific demand, okay? So the neutrophils are the first out on the scene. They're gonna be seen in the highest numbers in your white blood cells, all right? So our total white blood cell counts, and when you get a CBC, you'll see a total WBC. That should be somewhere between six to 11. You'll see it different in different references. Sometimes they'll say four to 12. Sometimes they'll say three to 10. Somewhere around there is gonna be about what we're looking for, okay? If they're giving you something on an exam or you're in the hospital and their white blood cell count is 15, I hated getting that back on a CBC because that made me make some decisions that I wasn't sure about. Because when your body goes through an inflammatory response, it's gonna send white blood cells out. That's part of your inflammatory response. So let's say, you guys know, I'm a pediatric nurse practitioner, so I see kids, right? So if a kid came in, five days of fever, and I'm like, I don't know, this could be some bacteria brewing, let's take a look. So I'll draw CBC. In the CBC, if their white blood cell count is 15, oh man, okay, that could mean, it's elevated, right? It's definitely elevated. But it could mean that they have a little bit of a bacterial infection going on, or it could just be the inflammatory response, your body's under stress, and it's producing white blood cells. So that's kind of a gray area. Once we get somewhere between like 18, 19, that's kind of telling you, no, we really got a significant infection. Maybe it's a UTI, maybe it's pneumonia, maybe it's meningitis, maybe it's, it's something, but that's kind of getting up into the area where we're like, I don't like it. But I need a differential because the differential will give me a better idea, okay, of exactly where it's located, all right? So the neutrophils won't tell me a whole lot, and the reason they won't tell me a whole lot is because of the first out on the scene, they're very generic, okay? They usually mean, and this is usually, not always, but usually mean that there is some kind of bacterial infection brewing, okay? So the neutrophils are gonna go out there, check out the scene, be like, oh my gosh, something bad is happening, and it's a huge bacteria, and we need to gear up, and then it can find out kind of what bacteria it is by recognizing that different kind of cell, that bacteria cell, and then it's gonna go and get the specialized troops that are meant to attack that specific kind of cell. Okay, so for instance, we're gonna go over all these in detail, but for instance, if this is a huge allergic response, all right, a patient is allergic to bees, they get stung by a bee, that's obviously a giant anaphylactic reaction. The body recognizes, ah, something bad is happening, and it sends out the neutrophils, and it's gonna send out this inflammatory response. The neutrophils are gonna look at the scene and be like, looks like a bit of an allergy to me, and then they are going to go and get the specialized troops who are meant to attack allergies, and those are our eosinophils. Then they're gonna send out a bunch of eosinophils to the area to fix that allergic response, okay? So that's how the different white blood cells are going to work together, okay, in order to help us out. So neutrophils, always first on the scene, highest in number. Usually it means that there's a big bacterial infection that is either brewing or that you've already got. We already talked about the eosinophils, okay? So eosinophils are almost always gonna be an allergic response, okay? So they're gonna come out if the patient has a ginormic allergic response like an anaphylaxis, or they can even come out in small numbers when you just have really bad like allergic rhinitis, hay fever, or some kind of allergies. Eosinophils will also come out in a giant inflammatory response, okay? Now, anaphylaxis is an example of an inflammatory response, okay? But there's lots of different things that can cause an inflammatory response. So let's say you have rheumatoid arthritis, that's an inflammatory response. Let's say you got burned, that's an inflammatory response, okay? So they're gonna come out in allergies, an inflammatory response, and the last one that they typically do is they come out in a parasitic or a parasite infection, okay? These are the ones that give you the heebie-jeebies. These are like the worms and the, those kind of things. Drink contaminated water, eat something contaminated, or fecal oral route, which is even grosser, okay? So if your eosinophils are super elevated, that tells me I have one of three things going on. Either this is an allergic response, it's a huge inflammatory response to something going on in your body, or you got the worms, and it's kind of gross, okay? But that's what, that's what we're looking for with eosinophils, okay? Our next white blood cell differential is gonna be our basophils, all right? Basophils are a little bit more complicated. They do a little bit more things. There's not very many of them because our body doesn't have to deal with this kind of response very often, but they do produce a couple of things. 
They're gonna produce heparin, which we know heparin is a blood thinner. It helps with clotting. And this is a natural kind of form of heparin in your body, not the synthetic form that we give patients. It also is going to um, come out in or produce a histamine response. Now, histamine gets a little tricky because it's a good and a bad thing. Okay, so we're gonna produce histamine. And we are also going to produce um, heparin. Histamine and heparin. So heparin, we know what that does. All right, histamine has functions in a couple of different places. One, inside your body, all right? So all throughout our body, we have a form of histamine that comes out in an allergic reaction. Histamine is considered a hole poker, okay? So what histamine does, okay, is it goes and forms this, it, it happens in a big allergic response, right? Um, but it hole pokes, meaning it goes into your vessels and it pokes holes, causing leakage into the third space, okay? Why would it do that? It needs a little bit of help, okay? And so when we have this allergic response, not only are we having a big inflammatory response, which kind of causes some third spacing, okay? But we also are going to have histamine that comes out and pokes holes in your vessels, which causes leakage into the third space, which gives us our runny nose, our runny eyes, those kind of things, okay? We talked about an inflammatory response before. All right, the inflammatory response is meant to help our body, correct? So in the inflammatory response, your body's gonna panic, realize, oh my gosh, something bad is happening, right? When something bad is happening, it's gonna send out this giant response, okay? This giant response is meant to be helpful, okay? It is meant to get white blood cells and neutrophils and eosinophils and basophils and your complement system and all these different things to the area to help, okay? But what happens whenever you have an inflammatory response, I'm gonna draw it really quickly, here's your vessel. Your body realizes something bad happens. Let's say it's anaphylaxis, okay? Something bad happened, you got stung by a bee. Your body recognizes, oh my gosh, something bad happens. I'm gonna vasodilate, okay? So I'm gonna open up my vessels kind of like opening up the road to allow more things to get to the area. It thinks that it's a helpful response, but what happens when I vasodilate is my blood pressure is going to go down, okay? Anytime we vasodilate, that opens up the vessels, kind of tanks your blood pressure a little bit. Anytime I change the pressure inside my vessels, that tells my body, oh my gosh, something is happening. My cells probably need more nutrients. They need more electrolytes. They need more oxygen. So it's going to increase my capillary permeability. So these are little capillaries that come out of here, okay? When that happens, you're gonna dump fluid from inside the vessel out here to get to your cells, okay? But the problem that happens is you're dumping so much fluid out of the vessels, it's gonna tank your blood pressure even further, causing severe hypotension. The worst case scenario in a patient with hypotension, not enough blood pressure, is there's not enough pressure or to get to the organs, to get to the cells. So if the organs don't get perfusion, the cells don't get perfusion, they die, okay? So a patient anaphylaxis will typically die from this life-threatening hypotension and decrease perfusion to your organs and to your cells before they will die of the <gasps> that we typically think of whenever we think of a breathing response, okay? So this is an example of the inflammatory reaction, okay? This happens in any time we have severe inflammation. You can apply this to any nursing principle anywhere, all right? Let's say I have allergies, right? Just regular allergies, not anaphylaxis, okay? I walk outside, there's pollen outside, my body is allergic to it. <gasps> my body realizes something is wrong, right? When it realizes something is wrong, it's gonna form this inflammatory response. We're gonna vasodilate, increase our capillary permeability. It's gonna go into the third space and get trapped out here, okay? So now I've got very little fluid in my vessels, okay? And I've got a lot of fluid in my third space, which gives me runny nose, runny eyes. Everything is leaking into a spot that it's not supposed to leak into, okay? That's the inflammatory response. Now, the reason it vasodilates is to get the neutrophils and the eosinophils and the basophils and all those things out to the area. Okay? All right. So with that said, okay, that's the normal inflammatory response and that's how all of these things are getting to the area. Now what histamine does is it's gonna come in and poke more holes. Okay? When I poke more holes, 
That's gonna cause more fluid to leak into the third space. So when you get tons of histamine from an allergic response, I can't breathe, my nose is dripping, my eyes are dripping, I'm just kind of weepy, I look kind of puffy, right? Uh, but it doesn't leave enough fluid in the vessels. When there's not enough fluid in the vessels, that's when we go into shock. So patients that get anaphylaxis can go into shock because they don't get enough perfusion to the kidneys and the kidneys die and then all the other organs die after that and that is called MODS or multi-organ dysfunction syndrome. This can happen in a huge infection because when I get an infection, whether it's viral, bacterial, fungal, doesn't matter what it is, okay, my body recognizes there's something wrong, sends out this huge inflammatory response vasodilates, increases my capillary permeability, all the fluid leaks to the third space, leaves you with very fluid inside, very little fluid inside the vessels, and you don't get enough perfusion to your organs and your organs die. That is what happens in shock, okay? That is what shock means. So in these patients, they can actually go into septic shock, and this same process happens. That's why we can treat the infection in shock and septic shock, but we can't, we need something to plug up all these holes because I could give them all the fluids in the world and they could still be hypotensive because there's so many holes in your vessels and it's leaking into the third space, okay? You have to understand that concept in order to understand exactly what happens when we have an infection and why we aggressively treat it. It can go into the bloodstream, it can cause this huge inflammatory response, we're in septic shock, and now it's very, very difficult to treat, all right? So our basophils, now we understand what histamine does, it's a hole poker, we understand what heparin does, Basophils also come out in an allergic response. Of course, that's where the histamine is coming from, right? So this is for our allergic response. The heparin comes out whenever we have a clotting issue, okay? You'll see this happen in a condition called DIC, disseminated intravascular coagulation. I'm sure you've heard of DIC before, we just don't cover it very aggressively in nursing school and we should. So what happens when I send out this huge inflammatory response is I'm sending out all this heparin which is gonna thin my blood, right? And it's going to work against clotting. But when my body is, is panicking, I'm also sending out clotting factors, okay? So I'm clotting in part of my body and I'm bleeding out in half of my body, not half. When I, I literally, all when I was in nursing school, I thought when they said half your body, it was like split in half. And like this half was clotting and this half was bleeding. And that's definitely not what happens. It's just different parts of your body. You're gonna get clots in lots of places and then you're gonna be bleeding out in other places. That is incredibly difficult to treat because if I give them more heparin to fix the clotting problem, then they're gonna bleed out. If I give them something to clot because they're bleeding out, then we're gonna cause a life-threatening clot, like an MI, a stroke, or something similar to that, okay? So, that's what basophils do. So we've got neutrophils, eosinophils, we've got basophils. We also have monocytes, which are in our differential, okay? So in the monocytes, we don't talk about these a lot, um, but we should. <laughs> so monocytes are a special kind of white blood cell and they come out anytime there is viral, bacterial, or any kind of cell injury, okay? So we've got a viral, bacterial, or any kind of cell injury. And that could be in anything from, I mean, a burn, it could be sepsis, it could be anything that has caused injury to my cells, okay? Those are monocytes. Okay, and I'm gonna take a picture of this and it's kind of hard to see right now. But don't worry, you'll get a copy. All right, the last kind that we're gonna see in the differential is called lymphocytes. Okay, so our lymphocytes typically come out in a viral infection. Okay. So lymphocytes usually come out in a viral infection. That could be anything from mononucleosis, the kissing disease right? It could be anything. Uh, it could be a viral meningitis. It could be the flu, okay? So if I do a CBC and my white blood cell count is 16, then I also want to make sure that we've done a differential. And the differential, we see that the neutrophils are really high. Monocytes are slightly elevated. In that case, that means that we have a bacterial infection that's going on, okay? That bacterial infection is gonna lead us to now search where the bacterial infection is. So now I know I've got a CBC, my white blood cell count told me that my uh, white blood cells were elevated. That tells me I have some kind of infection, viral, bacterial, allergic, fungal, something. Then I did a differential that told me that, okay, not only do you have an infection going on, but you very likely have a bacterial infection going on. 
Okay. Then I'm going to start searching for the source. Is it in the urine? Is it in the chest? Is it a pneumonia? Is it in the spinal cord? Is this a meningitis? Do we need to do an LP? Then I can actually start searching for the source of the infection. Okay. All right. Do we understand the CBC with differential? Does that make sense? Any questions so far? So we're going to kind of block this off a little bit. And this is our CBC with diff, or CBC with differential, okay? Now, on NCLEX and on exams, they're gonna ask you things like, <clears throat> how do we, or what, who are we worried about if they get an infection, or what kind of signs and symptoms would indicate, okay? The patients that we worry most about getting an infection are our immunocompromised patients. Those would be our patients that have HIV that causes all of our CD4 cells to be destroyed. Those are part of our white blood cells, our T cell, our T's and B lymphocytes. Um, we also would be worried about patients that are immunocompromised, let's say if they are on chemotherapy. Um, our patients that are on neutropenic precautions because they don't have an immune system, like if they're on chronic corticosteroids, or they're on immunosuppressants or methotrexate. So if we have any signs and symptoms of infection, like fever or an elevated white blood cell count, that is almost always going to be a priority as far as which patient do you see first. Because if they don't have an immune system to fight off this infection, we're in big trouble because that infection will just wreak havoc inside of their bodies and we've got to aggressively treat with antibiotics very quickly to kill that infection, to stop that inflammatory response before we go into full out sepsis, okay? So this is a CBC with diff. One other thing I'm gonna mention about the CBC with diff is something called SEGS and BANDS, okay? Sex and bands are something that we don't normally have. You're not gonna usually see this in a CBC. It'll be like a little note at the bottom that will tell you what the patient has, okay? So our SEGs are our mature neutrophils. We said neutrophils are first out on the scene, they're a bacterial. Um, so SEGs are our mature neutrophils. Bands are the immature neutrophils. So that tells me, if I've got bands, my body knows that there is a giant infection brewing and it is massively making tons of new neutrophils to get out onto the scene, but it is such a new infection that they haven't even had time to mature yet, okay? So if you see SEGS and BANDS on the CBC, that means we are about to sport a ginormous infection. We're in trouble. The only time that these can even possibly be normal is in a brand new baby, all right? I'm talking brand spanking new. <laughs> because their body's immune system is just learning how to function. It is just starting. So we may see uh, a couple of bands right at the beginning, okay? But if we continue to see the sags and bands increase, if the white blood cell count keeps going up, that tells me this baby has a neonatal infection, okay? So you may hear doctors throw these words around, oh, they got sags and bands, okay? Sags and bands, big giant infection coming. You better gear up and get ready. Get those antibiotics ready. Get that PPE ready. Get ready to protect your patient before we go into a huge inflammatory response and before we go into sepsis, okay? So that's the CBC with diff. Those are the different things that you are looking for. Out of these SEGs and bands, we have something called an A and C that I wanna mention because when I talk about this with students, they don't know what I'm talking about. And <clears throat> it is something that we usually see on our cancer modules, um, but we can also use it for patients that are chronically immunocompromised. So the ANC, A-N-C, stands for absolute neutrophil count, okay? We already know what neutrophils do. So this absolute neutrophil count is gonna be a calculation that we have to do, and here's how to calculate it, okay? The ANC, you're gonna take your total white blood cell count, you're gonna multiply that times the SEGS plus the bands. Okay? So on your CBC, you're gonna get the number of SEGs, the number enough to actually get out in the public and not hurt themselves, okay? Not get a huge infection. So most commonly what you'll see is a patient is on chemotherapy. We completely wiped out their immune system, all right? They don't have an immune system anymore. They can't fight anything. Um, it's done what it was supposed to do. They're off the chemotherapy, but it takes a while for your body to kick in and make this new immune system. We don't wanna send that patient home if they don't have enough of an immune system to be able to fight something off, right? So we use the A and C count because we can't use their white blood cell count as an indication, okay? 
Tell me why we can't use their white blood cell count as an, their total white blood cell count as an indication if they have an immune system or not. I see you in here, Vicki, just seeing if you know. The, when we give chemotherapy, its job is to go in, find cells, and kill them, okay? It doesn't, it's not able to differentiate, oh, this is a cancer cell, or this is a white blood cell, or this is a red blood cell, this is a platelet. It just goes in and kills cells. So when it does that, it completely wipes out our white blood cell count, it wipes out our red blood cells, it wipes out our platelets, and we typically get something called pancytopenia. Pan means all. Think of it like doing a panoramic photo, right? So pan means all, cyto means cell, penia means low. So all cell lines are low, right? That puts my patient at huge risk. That's why all our chemotherapy patients are on neutropenic precautions because they have no white blood cells to fight. So if they're actively on chemotherapy, their white blood cell count is gonna be super low, right? Because it's wiping out their cells. So we're not gonna be able to use the white blood cell count as an indicator that they're getting an infection like we would in a healthy body who, get exposed to an infection, get an infection inside their body, white blood cell count goes straight up, okay? And these patients, they can get an infection and their white blood cell count won't do anything because the chemotherapy is killing it, okay? Same when your body is kind of trying to make new white blood cells after the chemotherapy is over, okay? Um, as the white blood cell count increases, we're actually happy about that because that means that your body does have some sort of an immune system, but it may still stay low for a long period of time. So the ANC is a better way for us to determine if the patient is ready to go home, if they're able to go home, okay? We want an ANC greater than 500 in order for that patient to go home, to be able to be healthy, to be able to not, you know, be able to go to drink out of a water fountain and not get a huge infection, okay? So ANC greater than 500 is what we're looking for in patients that were immunocompromised or patients that were um, on chemotherapy and now we're looking to see can they survive outside of a hospital with some sort of an immune system, okay? So that's the A and C, absolute neutrophil count. It is often seen on nursing exams as a calculation question. So you need to know how to do this. Take your total white blood cell count, multiply it by the sex plus the bands. You've gotta do this part first, okay? So sex plus bands has to be done first. Then you multiply it times total white blood cell count. Okay? All right, so we did a CBC with differential. We did an absolute neutrophil count, okay? There are two labs that I wanna discuss very quickly. We've already talked about them before, but I want to just briefly mention them here because it definitely is something that we're gonna be doing um, if the patient has a big infection or an inflammatory response, right? Does anybody know what the two labs are um, that we will utilize to tell us that we have a huge amount of inflammation? Now it won't tell us where the inflammation is occurring, but it will tell us that we have a huge inflammatory response. Do we know what that is? We are going to draw an ESR. And a CRP. And what these are are two markers of inflammation. Now when you have a huge infection, your inflammatory response has come out, okay? Your inflammatory response is going to come out when it notices anything is wrong with your body, okay? So in a giant inflammatory response like anaphylactic response or a big bacterial infection, this is your ESR, erythrocyte sedimentation rate, and your CRP, which is a C-reactive protein. Both of these are markers of inflammation, but they're not specific. So all it tells me is, wowzas, you have a huge inflammatory response going on. I don't know what's going on. I need to do a little more digging to figure out exactly where that inflammatory response is coming from so that I can treat it, okay? So those are two labs you will see when the patient has a giant infection, okay? So I just wanted to mention those so you know what they are, okay? All right, now let's talk about kind of what we've done so far, what's led us up to this point. Patient came in, obviously very sick. We couldn't really figure out exactly what was wrong just based off of history and we're like, okay, I know there's something wrong with you, but I, I, don't, I don't know how to treat you. I don't know exactly what it is. So we do a CBC with differential. 
CBC tells us the white blood cell count is elevated. That tells me I have some kind of infection, okay? Then I did a differential. I'm looking to see, is this a bacterial, an allergic, an inflammatory response, a parasite? Is there histamine and heparin coming out from this? Is there a cell injury? What is happening? That will kind of guide me to, okay, I think I know sort of what's going on. So let's say the neutrophils and the monocytes are really high. That tells me, okay, my patient's total white blood cell count is high. I know that they have some kind of bacterial infection. There's no <coughs> obvious source. I don't see that they're having severe coughing. I don't see that they're having burning when they pee. I don't see anything that looks very obvious, okay? So then I have to go digging a little deeper. Now I'm gonna do my ESR and CRP. Both of those are elevated. That tells me, whoa, we have a big inflammatory response. We have a big bacterial infection going on. Now I've gotta go and search and find where is this infection at, okay? So in order to do that, a good color let's see in order to do that we're gonna have to go searching for a bacteria okay so I want you to tell me how would we go searching for a bacteria what kind of things are we going to do and how are we gonna interpret those so just tell me what you know as far as how do I find out where this infection is located Anytime we are looking for a specific site of infection, okay, the only way to determine exactly what's going on in that site, is there bacteria present, what kind of bacteria is present, and how do I treat it, is to do my cultures, okay? So we're going to be doing cultures. That is the only thing that's definitive. Now you may have on a nursing school exam, how do you know if a patient has a UTI? Well, they may have an answer choice that says a urinalysis. Well, a urinalysis can kind of guide me to saying like maybe they have something going on, but a culture is really the only thing that's gonna tell me, is it growing bacteria? Did your urine truly have a lot of bacteria? What kind of bacteria and what kind of antibiotic will help you? So don't choose a urinalysis as a definitive because it's not. All it tells me is there's some junk in there that shouldn't be there. Let's do a culture just to see, because I've seen lots of urines that did not look good. <laughs> Either the patient's dehydrated or they have poor hygiene or, you know, something is going on and I look at the urine and I'm like, oh, this looks like it's probably infected. Then I run a culture and it comes back and it's a normal culture. There's no bacteria, just normal like skin bacteria, okay? So a definitive, okay, for a certain kind of infection is going to be a culture, okay? So with that said, let's go searching and find out what this guy's got. So we could do all kinds of different cultures. Now, especially in babies, so if you guys are in a peds course, pediatrics course, their infections are hard to find sometimes because they don't present normally like adults do. Like if I have pneumonia, I'm probably gonna have a cough and fever and chills and I'm gonna be having trouble breathing. Um, babies don't always present that way. Same with a UTI. A UTI, especially in a baby or somebody very young who can't tell us what's going on, um, they usually have no signs and symptoms. Zero, none, okay? All they typically have is fever of unknown origin. We know they're not feeling good. We know that they're really sick. Their white blood cell count is typically high, okay? But there's no signs and symptoms. So we really have to go looking. If the case that we have a neonate or a little baby, and that's usually anyone below two months of age present with just fever, okay? Then we typically have to do a full sepsis workup to find the source of the infection, which means we're doing a UA and urine culture. We're doing a blood culture to see if there's a blood infection. We're gonna do an LP, which is a lumbar puncture. Is there meningitis present? We're doing a chest X-ray, right? To see, is there a pneumonia present, okay? So there's lots of different cultures we can do to find the source of the infection, to find out what kind of bacteria is brewing, and then to find out what kind of antibiotics I need to treat with, okay? So we're gonna talk about the most common that you're gonna see. Usually that is a urine culture blood culture, sputum culture, we could do a stool culture, you can even do a nasal swab, a lumbar puncture, or a throat culture. And there are a couple other ones, but these are going to be the most common, okay? So what I'd like you to do is to look at each of these, and I want you to tell me what are you looking for? What kind of infections can be present? Okay, that's your next assignment. I'm gonna give you a few minutes to do that.
right, so what do we got on our cultures? All right, so let's talk about the different cultures we can do. Now we can do a urine culture. Like I said, you can do a UA, right? But the UA will only give us an idea that there may be something going on. In the UA, okay, you may see bacteria. This is just in the UA, okay? You may see um, a little bit of blood. Sometimes we may have that with a UTI just because your bladder's irritated. In pyelonephritis, you'll see a lot of blood, okay? You may see um, something called leukocytes. And leukocytes come out especially in a urine infection. And one other thing you may see too in the urine is something called nitrites, okay? So leukocytes are a special kind of white blood cell that comes out of the urine. Nitrites are the poop of the bacteria, okay? So what can happen is, let's say a patient comes in, says they're having pain with urination, they just went to the bathroom before they came, then we hand them this cup and we're like, go oh, pee. So they go pee, but they have just peed. And so basically that washed out kind of everything. So we may not see a whole bunch of bacteria in that sample because it hasn't set in the bladder long enough to collect infection. But if we see nitrites, okay, nitrites are the poop of the bacteria. So that means it's a byproduct, right? Because bacteria cells are living, breathing things, right? They, um, they're actual cells. They're actually like little humans, okay? Little humans poop. I know, because I've got kids. They poop all the time. So nitrites in the UA tells me Bacteria has been here. You may not see it in this sample, but it's been here. So you'll see nitrites, okay? Nitrites in there tell me you got bacteria somewhere, even if it doesn't show up in your sample, okay? So you may see positive bacteria, blood, leukocytes, nitrites. Your specific gravity may be elevated because look at all this junk that's inside the urine. So your specific gravity will be high. And the way I remember specific gravity is the specific gravity of water is one, okay? So water is one. So the farther away it is from one, or the thicker it is, the worse it looks, the less it looks like water, the higher the specific gravity, okay? So your specific gravity will be high, the urine will look hazy because there's all kind of nasty stuff in it. If I see that on a UA, then I'm gonna run a urine culture. But here's where the issue happens with cultures. Ugh, any cultures, anything, any cultures, take three to five days to come back, okay? If I have a patient with bacterial meningitis and I wait three to five days for that lumbar puncture culture to come back, or that spinal tap to come back, that patient will be dead by that point. So what we do in an infection is if we have these preliminary labs that we've drawn and we're like, ooh, it doesn't look good, we're gonna go ahead and start them on something called empiric antibiotics. Empiric antibiotics mean, okay, I don't know specifically what kind of infection that they have. I don't know what is susceptible to this bacteria because I don't even know what bacteria that it is. I'm gonna throw my best guess at it and decide what I think the bacteria that is growing probably is, and then I'm gonna give an antibiotic that's susceptible to that bacteria. It's a guess, okay? A lot of times we're right, sometimes we're wrong, okay? So let's say I have a patient, it's an eight-year-old that comes in, says that she, it's been burning whenever she goes to the bathroom, okay? I draw a UA on her, she's got high specific gravity, she's got bacteria, blood, leukocytes, nitrites, I'm like, this looks very suspicious for a UTI, I'm gonna send it off for culture, it's gonna take two days to come back, but I can't wait two days for that bacteria to multiply in her body. So I'm going to say, okay, based on her age, she's never had a UTI before, let's give her either some amoxicillin, which is still considered first line drug, doesn't work all the time, but sometimes, or Bactrim is another good choice for UTIs. So I'm gonna pick one of those based on my clinical judgment, okay? I'm going to give that to the patient and send them home, okay? Or if they're in the hospital, we're gonna give it to them IV and just cross our fingers and hope that it works. Then in two days when that urine culture comes back, it's gonna tell me exactly what bacteria is in there. It's gonna tell me if there's bacteria at all. You know, it may be that she's having these symptoms and then I get the culture back and it's negative. And I'm like, well, okay, that means she doesn't have a UTI. So there's gotta be a different source of the dysuria and the fever and those kind of things. Okay, so when I get this urine culture back, two days later, it'll say, yes, she does have a UTI. She is positive for E. coli. It will tell me how much E. coli is in the urine, okay? Which is important for me to know because how I collect that sample determines how much bacteria needs to be present, okay? Let me give you an example. Um, they call clean catch urine where you just take the cup and just put it underneath and you pee in it, clean catch. It is the dirtiest. There's nothing clean about clean catch. People don't wash their hands. People touch the outside of the container. They touch the inside of the container. They touch it to their private parts whenever they're trying to collect it. They do, oh, 
God bless them. They have all kinds of things that make it not sterile, okay? So my UA doesn't always give me a super clear picture and it can be very contaminated, okay? Um, okay, I'll give you a story. One time, I think I was, I was a medical assistant and I was working in an outpatient pediatric clinic and this little boy comes in and he was complaining that it hurt whenever he peed. It's not super common for boys to have UTIs because they have a longer urethra um, and there's not as big of an opening and there's not as much bacteria stuff there. Um, but we're like, let's get a urine sample just to make sure because it does happen sometimes. So I told him and I was very clear about how to do a clean catch urine, okay? They're supposed to pee a little bit first and that's to kind of clear out the urethra, it's to kind of clear out all of that so we can get a good specimen, okay? And then they're supposed to, once they peed a little bit, once the stream has started, then they're supposed to go underneath and put it the cup underneath the stream. I didn't say it exactly like that though, because he was eight, okay? What I said was, you need to pee a little bit in the toilet first and then take the cup and put it underneath and go ahead and pee in the cup, okay? That was his understanding. He said he understood. I thought I said it clearly. I apparently didn't. I get the urine back and it is like clear as a bell. I mean, it's like, it looks like water. So I'm like, so I put it on the UA and I'm testing it and the specific gravity is one. So what does that tell me? Okay, either this kid has a severe case of diabetes and syphilis or something happened here. Maybe he just went and ran sink water. I, I don't know. So I went back into the room and I'm like, I'm surprised at your the way that your pee looks. So can you show me or tell me exactly how you collected this urine? So he did exactly as I told him. He peed a little bit first and then he took the cup and did this motion just like I did and dipped it into the toilet and picked it up and peed in the cup. Okay, true story. So it was contaminated because it was um, TT water. So we had to throw out that specimen, give him a bunch of water and wait for him to pee again. Okay, so you have to make sure you get a clean specimen. So clean catch is actually very dirty. It is the dirtiest kind of way that we can collect urine. So because of that, when the urine culture comes back, we require a very high bacterial count in order to say that it is actually an infection. So if you do a clean catch, you need more than 100,000 bacteria, okay, in order to say that it's actually a true UTI. Now, a great and sterile way to collect urine is to do a cath, right? But, I mean, if a 38-year-old woman comes in and says it burns when she pees, I'm not cathing her, okay? So clean catch is kind of the standard for what we usually do, even though it's super dirty. But if you did a, if you actually did do a cath and collected it, you only need 50,000 bacteria because it's supposed to be sterile, so we would expect less bacteria. Now the most sterile way to collect urine is to take a big giant needle, go straight through their super pubic area and aspirate. Get some of that urine out <clears throat> and then you put it into the urine culture. Now obviously we don't do this very often. Um, it's iodine and it's super sterile and all of that. We would use that only if there was some kind of an obstruction or if there was maybe ambiguous genitalia or something like that. We've had like little babies where their urethras are so tiny that we really can't even get in the smallest catheter that we've got and it will cause trauma or bleeding. So that may be an option for us if we absolutely have to get urine, but that is the most sterile way to do that. So we only require 10,000 bacteria to say it's a UTI for that. So that's why putting the source, and you'll see whenever you go to the hospital, that the source um, is written on your lab slip. And so that's the reason why the source is put on there. So that way, whenever this, these culture results come to your NP or come to the MD, we can look at it and say, okay, this was a calf. It only grew 10,000 bacteria. Eh, chances are it probably was just an external contamination because it says it was just mixed flora. That's not a UTI. But if we, let's say we cath the patient, I get it back and it grew E. coli, which is the most common bacteria we see in UTIs, and it is greater than 50,000 bacteria, I'm like, okay, that's a true UTI. Then at the bottom of that lab culture report, it will give us a susceptibility report. So it will tell us which antibiotics are gonna work on that specific bacteria for your patient. That helps to guide our treatment decisions. It's happened before, and it happens a lot, by no fault of the doctor or the NP, but when we have to give empiric antibiotics to our patients because the cultures take so long to come back um, and we throw our best guess antibiotic, we may be wrong, okay? So let's say this is a patient <clears throat> comes in first UTI, um, we give them amoxicillin, so we're like, oh, it's their first UTI, it'll probably work. We get the culture back, we did a clean catch, it's greater than 100,000 bacteria, it grew E. coli, and we look down on the susceptibility report and it says amoxicillin resistant. 
we done messed up, okay? Now that's not negligence, it's not malpractice. We did our very best as far as practicing medicine and it just, this time it grew something different or that strain that they had was resistant, okay? So in that case, we would take them off of the amoxicillin, obviously, because it's not gonna work, and we're gonna put them on something that shows in the susceptibility report that it is susceptible, something like Bactrim or uh, Macrodantin or something like that, okay? So that's how we use the UA in the urine culture. Okay, so the UA gives us an idea something is going on. The urine culture tells us definitively that there is something going on, all right, that we definitely have a UTI. So our cultures are definitive. They are what they are. The unfortunate part is they take several days to come back, okay? So urine culture is gonna take about two to three days to come back, so we'll start on empiric therapy. Blood cultures, let's talk about that. So blood cultures is something I would draw if I thought the patient might be septic or it's a possibility they could be getting septic right? Because remember what happened in our big inflammatory response? We vasodilate, increase capillary permeability. There's bacteria kind of everywhere. The most common places that you're going to see bacteria that can lead to sepsis are places that are highly vascular, got a lot of blood flow, like kidneys, like lungs. Those are huge. Brain, okay? Lots of blood flow, okay? Um, heart is another one, lots of blood flow. So if you get endocarditis, so that is a bacteria that forms around the valves. Well, what pumps through your valves all day, every day? Blood, right? So that blood is picking up all that bacteria and just sending it out to the bloodstream and to the rest of the body, okay? So endocarditis, high rate of sepsis. Pneumonia, high rate of sepsis because the lungs are very vascular and you've got lots of blood flow going through them. Kidneys, highly vascular. So a pyelonephritis can go into sepsis very easily because all your blood flow is going through your kidneys, okay? So you have to watch those signs of infection, but even after I find my site, okay, I still have to be looking for sepsis, all right? And we're gonna draw a blood culture for that. Now the only big problem with blood culture, this one takes a whop in five days to come back. Well, dadgum, I would be completely septic by then if I waited, okay? So once I find the source of the infection, I'm going to aggressively treat with antibiotics while I wait for my blood culture to come back. We may need to switch after that, but what you'll usually see in empiric therapy, if I really feel like the patient might be getting septic or has a high risk, is you're gonna put them on, uh, it's called empiric therapy, but we're gonna do double coverage antibiotics. So I'm gonna do one that covers mostly gram positive and one that covers mostly gram negative. That way I'm kind of covered across the board. That way I don't wait five days, find out I gave the wrong antibiotic and now the patient's already in septic shock, okay? So that's when you'll see people give like vanc and gent, okay? Vancomycin, gentamicin. Those are big heavy hitters, okay? Um, but that will cover our positive and our negative until we get this culture back, okay? Blood cultures have to be drawn separately from everything else. It's gotta be sterile because I don't need any outside contamination. You cannot draw them from an IV. It's contaminated, okay? You cannot try to do a venipuncture for electrolytes and CBC and then draw the blood culture after that. You already messed up. Okay, you have to draw the blood culture from a completely separate site, okay? Most of the time we use alcohol and iodine to prep and it comes in special blood culture bottles that you have to use and send off. So it's not like a normal blood sample. These have gotta be sterile, okay? Sputum cultures. So we will use that to determine our course of treatment for pneumonia, because when we say pneumonia, okay? Oh, good job, Jessica, hey girl. Um, when we say pneumonia, Pneumonia could be viral, bacterial, fungal, aspiration, community acquired, hospital acquired. It's too much of a guessing game to try to decide. So if we have a patient that comes in, presents like pneumonia, fever, chills, cough, whatever, we do a CBC. CBC shows, whoa, we got an elevated white blood cell count. Their white blood cell count is 22. We've got segs and bands. That means, whoa, okay, big infection coming. Patient's not looking good, so we do a chest x-ray, we see some junky stuff on the chest x-ray, we're like, that's not good either, okay? That tells me I have an infection in my lungs. It does not tell me exactly what kind of infection or what kind of bacteria, and there's a lot of nasty bacteria that grows in the lungs, okay? Mycoplasma's nasty, okay? Um, you can get all kinds of pneumococcal, blech, okay? So in order to know how to treat it, I've got to do a sputum culture. Sputum cultures take about three days. You'd be dead from pneumonia if we waited that long, right? So I'm gonna do, have them do the sputum culture. Now this always confused me in nursing school, okay? So I thought sputum spit, right? And that what sputum is? Mm, nope, okay? Sputum is like the deep, nasty, smoker's cough, hacking up junk. And then once you hack up that junk, you spit it into the sterile container. Mm. So make sure whatever you're collecting in this culture cup, okay, that it is 
you have to tell patients, don't touch the outside, don't touch the inside. And like the outside, outside, you can hold it, obviously. But like the top where we're actually collecting stuff from and the inside of the cup should be sterile. Because if your hands are nasty and then you touch the inside of the cup, it's gonna show up as a bacteria when you don't actually have one, okay? So the sputum culture, they like to ask questions about how to collect sputum cultures, okay? So there's a couple things you as the nurse can do in order to get the sputum culture collected. So have the patient sit up, because that's gonna help to lung expand, okay? So you're gonna have them sit upright, make sure that they have not eaten. I do not need some chewed up carrots in this cup, okay? Because no thank you. So make sure they haven't eaten recently. Um, a lot of times they'll have them rinse their mouth with water to make sure you just get all the food and the nastiness, the normal nastiness that lives in the mouth, okay? So just have them rinse with some water, sit, sit up, have them take a few big deep breaths because we want to get that deep nasty junk at the bottom of the lungs. So have them take big breaths and then try to expectorate, okay? So you're going to try to, <laughs> that's such a weird word, have them try to cough up some junk. Once they've coughed up the junk, then hold the cup, but don't let their lips touch the cup because your lips are nasty too, okay? Not you personally, I'm sure yours are lovely, but patients, they have dirt and they have bacteria and things like that. So you wanna just have them spit it into the cup, put the top on, and then it goes on off to the lab, okay? We can put them on empiric antibiotics for this bacteria until we get it back, okay? You'll also see sputum cultures done for tuberculosis, the big TB, and we use that also to guide our therapy and to see is the patient getting better or are they not getting better? We'll know with the sputum culture, okay? All right, next one is a stool culture. This one takes about two to three days to come back. We would do a stool culture only if we suspected a big old giant bacterial infection in the gut, okay? We do not do stool cultures if we think they have a little stomach virus, okay? Because by the time we catch the stool culture and it showed something, they probably already have gotten rid of it and it doesn't really test very well for viruses. It tests mostly for bacteria, okay? Um, you can also do with the stool culture, you'll sometimes hear them say stool culture and O and P. The O and P is ova and parasites, so I'm also looking for nasty parasites and ova, they're little tiny eggs, okay? So the stool culture, like uh, we would do this for patients that have had severe diarrhea, they've had bloody diarrhea, they've had pus in their stool, and it's been going on for a good period of time, then we're like, hmm, this isn't very normal. So I'm probably gonna go ahead and do a stool culture to make sure you don't have something bacterial that I need to treat with antibiotics, okay? So stool cultures um, are collected. I don't know if you've ever seen them. It's awful to have the patient do it. Like, I mean, it's awful for us to do it too, but God bless them. If we send them home with this stool culture and it's like just this little poo shovel and they've got to catch the poo in a potty hat and they scoop out their poo with the little shovel into the cup until it fills up past a certain point. It does have a preservative in it so that the poop doesn't just sit in there and just like ferment. Um, and you can use multiple stool samples to get one stool culture. So like if we have a baby that's got really bad watery diarrhea, we may not be able to scoop enough out of the diaper to get enough for one sample. So it's okay to use multiple um, stool experiences <laughs> to make one stool culture, okay? Now, the only reason why I put nose up here um, for you guys to know, now we can do nasal swabs, like uh, we can do a flu swab that's intranasal, that's a quick viral culture that we can do right there in the office. Um, we can do a quick RSV swab, right? That's a viral swab, we can do it again right there in the office, okay? But the nose culture here that I'm talking about is there's some hospitals that will do nasal cultures to test their patients for MRSA, okay? Because MRSA likes to colonize in your body and once it makes a home in there, it never ever, I almost fell over, did y'all see that? It never ever wants to leave. And so sometimes you won't see an abscess or you won't actually see the source of the infection, but they're colonizing MRSA all up in their nose, okay? So what can happen, let's say you get one MRSA infection, you got an abscess two years ago. Well, that MRSA found itself a really nice home and wants to live with you for all of time. So it will just sit and colonize in your nose and you pick your nose or rub your nose or whatever and you touch something else in your house and sooner or later, your whole family has abscesses from MRSA. Bah, okay? So we need to know which of our patients are colonizing that stuff so we can put them on contact precautions. So most hospitals will have a certain day that they, um, they delineate as MRSA day, okay? And so let's say it's Monday. So Monday at five o'clock, everybody's getting an MRSA swab, everybody, okay? And we're sending it off to the lab, we're making sure nobody's colonizing. 
if you're colonizing, okay, and says like, okay, you don't have an active MRSA infection, but that stuff just living up there in your nose, then we'll get some Bactroban, um, also called Mupirocin ointment, put it on a Q-tip and it sticks in their nose like this twice a day for 10 days to get rid of that colonization. You gotta kick those suckers out your nose and tell them don't come back no more. Okay, so that's why I put the nasal culture up there because MRSA is grody and you need to know how it works and how we're testing for it, okay? All right, I also put an LP up here. That is a lumbar puncture. So those are patients that we are looking for meningitis, either viral or bacterial. Um, it is also called a spinal tap. And so they will stick a giant needle into their spinal cord, no big deal, um, and pull out some of that CSF, okay? Now this LP is very similar to what we do with the urine. We can actually look at the, um, the culture and look at what we got out. And if it's really clear and it looks good and it looks healthy, it's probably a viral meningitis or it's you have nothing. If it's cloudy and it's grody looking and it's not looking so great, then our suspicion for bacterial meningitis may be a little bit higher, okay? We could also test it rapidly for glucose, okay? You know, there's lots of glucose in your CSF, which is let's say a patient gets a head injury and then all of a sudden they're like, my nose is so runny, can I have a tissue? Be like, um because it could be CSF fluid leaking out of their nose. That's sort of a big deal. So when that happens, we test it for glucose, and if it has glucose in it, it's CSF. If it doesn't have glucose in it, it's not. See what I did? <laughs> I love this joke so much, y'all, I swear. It's not, you see what I did? It, it, okay, you see, it's snot or it's not, same thing, but you get what I'm saying. So glucose in it, oh my gosh, I'm never gonna stop laughing about that joke. If it has glucose in it, it usually is um, cerebral spinal fluid, but glucose present, I'm sorry, I can't stop it, typically means it is a viral infection. If there's no glucose present in it, which there should be, because it's CSF fluid, right? That means that it, they typically have a bacterial meningitis because bacteria like to go and eat all the sugar, therefore there's no sugar left, okay? So that's another good indication for us, oh my gosh, maybe this patient has bacterial meningitis. And then we need to put them on precautions very quickly and aggressively start antibiotics. So that's our LP. Um, this one can take a couple of days to come back, maybe two to three, same with the nose, okay? Throat culture I put up there because this one is so super important, especially in pediatrics, okay? Jessica, you feel me, I thank you so much. Um, throat culture, super important. Um, reason being, when we do a rapid strep in the office, that's the one, or you do it you know, in hospital, whatever, rapid strep them, you put it in the little thing and you cook it for six or seven minutes and you come back into the office, you're like, wow, your strep is negative, congratulations. Well, the problem with that is that strep, in, especially in children, can travel to other body I seriously cannot stop thinking about that joke. Can travel to other body parts. I do not find strep funny or going to the heart of the kidneys or any of those things. I just want y'all to know that. This is very serious, okay. So strep, if it's untreated or partially treated, can go into the hearts and cause um, an endocarditis or rheumatic fever. It can go to the kidneys and cause acute glomerulonephritis. It can also cause something called pandas where um, it, because of the strep bacteria that exists, your body um, aggressively treats the strep, but it also forms an autoimmune response and they can have like new onset, just psychosis. Like they just turn cuckoo crazy. Um, they'll have big fits of rage and they will be super forgetful and confused. I mean, like just a rapid behavior change. So strep has to be treated. It's really, really important that we aggressively treat strep, okay? So that's why I put the throat culture up here. This one comes, takes two days to come back. The throat culture is very, very important for us to do after a negative rapid strep, okay? <clears throat> A lot of reasons why. One, you may not get a good swab. If y'all ever done pediatrics, those kids move and they're crazy and it gags you so it's awful and they hate it. And unless you have a parent that knows the exact strep hold to do, it's hard to get a really good sample because you gotta really get back there in their throat. You can't just put it in their mouth, okay? So either you got a bad sample or it was a false negative or the parent brought them too early, right? Like um, the school calls at two o'clock, it's like your kid has a sore throat so the mom like runs out of work right, goes and grabs the kid, takes them right to the pediatrician. Well, the rapid streps don't pick up strep until, <coughs> sorry, I'm almost dying, until about 24 hours after the strep happens. There's not enough strep bacteria that's multiplied yet to register positive, okay? <clears throat> so if they come in too early, they may have strep, all right? But it may just be too early to tell. So we always need to do a backup culture, okay? So anybody that has a negative rapid strep we should do a backup throat culture. I have caught a lot of these. Our rapid streps only have a 95% specificity, which means 
that if I did 100 of these rapid strips, 95 of them would catch the positives. That means there are five kids out of that 100, okay, that have strep that didn't get picked up on this rapid strep. That could go, I mean, it could go away, and it could, but I don't wanna take that kind of gamble, right? So it could go to the heart or to the kidneys or to the brain and wreak all kinds of havoc. Jeffy, you asked me if pandas is becoming more recognized. Um, I wanna say yes, because I've seen some stuff um, kind of circulating in the research um, community, but because there hasn't been enough research done on it, there's still a huge amount of doctors that think that it is not real, that it's not a real diagnosis, that it's something else going on. Um, so I think there's a lot more research to be done on pandas. Um, I think that um, I've definitely seen some cases where, I mean, it's a pretty rapid and aggressive behavior change and that doesn't usually happen um, with certain kinds of psychological disorders. They typically happen over time. But that's the reason why I put the throat culture up there. It's really important for you guys to advocate for that if your physician or nurse practitioner does not order that, okay? Um, <clears throat> so I want you guys to understand that that should be done for every negative strep, okay? So all of that to say. Um, I got one more thing I wanna quickly cover with you about sepsis. All right, we talked about something wrong happening with your body. You get this huge inflammatory response. You vasodilate, increase capillary permeability. You get really hypotensive. You're gonna go into shock, okay? And all shock means is your kidneys aren't getting perfusion and they're about to die, okay? When your kidneys start dying, that's what we consider shock. I don't care if it's cardiogenic shock, septic shock, anaphylactic shock, doesn't matter, whatever kind of shock. Okay, it means that your kidneys are dying, which means all your organs are about to fail and you're gonna go into mods and then they'll die. That's why sepsis is such a big deal. So <clears throat> with all of that and all of this understanding, when sepsis has this huge inflammatory response and your body is so aggressively trying to treat this infection, it doesn't have much metabolism or perfusion or fluid or anything left to do any other part of your bodily functions, okay? So what it does is when they really get septic shock, so kidneys are starting to go down, right? We're gonna watch BUN, creatinine, GFR, decrease urine output. When we start to see kidneys are affected, we know, oh no, the patient's in shock. What happens after that is your body recognizes, I have very little fluid volume left in my vessels, okay? We could be pumping these patients full of fluid and it may not change their blood pressure because their capillary permeability is so open, okay? So what we will see then is your body recognizes, okay, I only have enough time and energy to do one thing. This is like you guys in nursing school, right? You've got people asking you, can you come to this birthday party? Come to this bar mitzvah? Like, can you come and hang out with me? Can you come and hold my hand? Can you come and pick me up from the airport? And you're like, okay, I'm just trying to get up and breathe today. And that's what your body is saying. It's like, I can only do one thing today and that is fight this infection, okay? So it can't keep up with the metabolic demands of the rest of your body. So it shifts from aerobic metabolism, which is I'm using oxygen, okay? I'm sucking up your oxygen to use all this. It switches its metabolism to anaerobic metabolism, okay? That means I'm gonna use less oxygen, I can take that oxygen and give it to the organs so that we don't die of mods, okay? When it does that, the byproduct that it secretes is called, let me use a different color, lactate. This is a huge big deal, and you'll see this on NCLEX a lot, okay? So a byproduct of that shift in metabolism, which happens only in shock, or mostly in shock at this point, okay? It's gonna produce lactate. So once their lactate gets over two, we're already gonna say, oh my gosh, they're building up this byproduct, they're, swift, they're shifting metabolism, they're in full out sepsis, okay? Once it gets higher than four, we're in big, big trouble, full out septic shock, your patient's about to totally crash out on you. So I want you to know what lactate level is and understand it so that way you'll know why they draw it in sepsis, okay? So they're using it to see how bad off are we um, <clears throat> and how aggressively do I need to treat this and how quickly do I need to move, okay? All right, so with all that said, okay, if I, you have any questions, please let me know. We covered a lot of stuff today, um, but this will give you a good coverage on exactly what you need in order to Find the patient's infection, figure out where it's at, find out what antibiotics to use if antibiotics are necessary, what I'm gonna draw, what I'm gonna expect, how I interpret the results. Um, this will help you greatly, okay? So if you guys have any questions, you can feel free to leave them in the comments. We will have this video up for the next 24 hours and then we are gonna pull it down after that. Um, but we will be re-releasing it on our videos on demand um, by next month, okay? So I will take a picture of the board that will go in the, um, 
in the group as well. Okay, and I will see you guys next time.